Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm here with Kane Baker to discuss scientific realism. Um, lots of you, hopefully, you should know his channel, Kane B. He's got amazing videos on philosophy of science, metaphysics, all sorts of different things. So definitely check that out. You can see the link in the description. And uh, he's also writing a dissertation on perspectivism in philosophy of science. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know much else to say by way of introduction, but I guess I'll turn it over to you if you want to plug anything or say anything. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm not really that good at, at introductions, so I'm not really sure what to say other than, uh, yeah, you know, if you're interested in philosophy, you should check out the channel because, yeah, there's, there's there's a lot of different topics on there, and I've been doing it for quite some time, so um, you know, quite a lot of quite a lot of content there that may be of interest, um, or maybe not. It's it's up to you. Do what you want. Uh, but I don't I don't know. Yeah, that's that's me. And I think your introduction was fine, so I, I don't really need to say anything. So I'm, I'm just going to stop talking now and hand it back over to you. <laughs> All right, sweet. So I guess we can probably start off by defining scientific realism and its different components, like the metaphysical and epistemic and semantic components of it. So um, can you walk us through sort of these different, you know, potential components of it? And yeah. Um, yeah, so, so scientific realism. Um, the, um, I mean, the, the, the simple way to put it, uh, you know, if you're just expressing it colloquially, would be to say, well, the scientific realist holds that our best theories about the world, uh, that we're justified in believing that our best theories are true. And so to break that down a little bit more precisely, um, different people have different conceptions of what exactly scientific realism is, which I imagine if anybody's ever explored philosophy, they'll know that everybody has different definitions of everything. But um, the definition that I quite like is, um, so scientific realism involves, first of all, a, a metaphysical claim, which is a claim that there is a mind independent external world. You know, there's, there's some, something out there beyond our minds. So, you know, we're ruling out things like idealism. Um, then there's a semantic claim, which is that our theories should be taken literally, they should be taken as a literal description, so that when uh, a scientific theory talks about things like electrons and mitochondria and black holes, um, you should, the, the right interpretation of that is that it is literally just trying to describe things in the world. Um, and so this would contrast with, um, I mean, these kinds of views aren't really very popular anymore, but um, they're it was once the case that um, there were a lot of philosophers who held that when theories make claims about things beyond what we can observe, um, those claims should be taken as, um, in some sense, maybe non-literal. Non so um, maybe instead of an, when, we, when scientists talk about electrons, right, really uh, they're just talking about, you know, tracks in cloud chambers and things like that. So claims about these unobservable things um, should be reinterpreted so that they're really claims about observables. As I say, those kinds of views aren't really very popular anymore. Um, but, you know, it's just worth saying, right? So there's the semantic claim, theories are literal descriptions. And then um, there's the epistemological claim, which is uh, a claim about justification. So um, the realist will say that in some cases, uh, obviously not in all cases, but in at least some cases, when we look at our, our best theories, um, theories that are, uh, you know, very, very well confirmed, theories that have, um, you know, a lot of explanatory power, theories in fields of science that are very mature. So, um, you know, think about things like, say, the standard model of particle physics. Um, we're justified in believing that those theories are true. Uh, so basically, there's a mind independent world out there. Our theories try to describe it, and some of them get it right. I think that would be the the way to put scientific realism. Uh, yeah, that's good. I, I think two things that we might want to dwell on briefly here might be the notion of approximate truth and also the, the distinction between unobservables and observables. So uh, approximate truth, well, you know, scientific realists, they recognize that, you know, all our current theories, even the ones in mature, you know, our mature scientists, and mature theories, and whatnot, the ones that have gained a kind of widespread acceptance, and we have the methodology down, they're not going to be perfectly accurate, you know, not going to be entirely, uh, you know, down to every minute detail, uh, capturing reality. And so what they really want to say, pretty much is, is 
that these theories are just approximately true. And uh, this has gotten a lot of pushback from a lot of anti-realists because they're like, well, what the hell do you guys mean by approximate truth, right? I mean, surely uh, either the cup's on the table or it's not on the table, right? There's no approximate fact of the matter there. So um, can you take us through like, I guess why this, I don't know, maybe just uh, illuminate approximate truth for us and, and why it matters at this stage. Um, well, you know, I, I don't know if I, if I necessarily agree completely with your characterization, uh, actually. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, there are, there are problems with the notion of approximate truth. Um, I don't know if that's the sort of usual line that anti-realists will take. And the reason is because it, it looks like we, well, there are very persuasive reasons to think that we're probably going to have to have some sort of notion of approximate truth whatever our view is on the realism anti-realism debate and so just to take your example of the uh, the cup on the table right so you said you know that look the cup's there or it's not there right and like that's that's it that's either true or false um but you know we might sort of look at that and say well okay but hang on a minute um you know when we talk about the cup on the table um like what exactly are we referring to when we use the term cup um, I mean, there are lots of uh, problems in metaphysics about like the constitution of objects, for instance, mm -hmm. I can, I'm just looking at a cup right now. Uh, <laughs> that's why I was looking away. I have a cup in front of me there. And, um, but, you know, uh, so, um, yeah, what, what was I saying? So, okay, I, I have this cup in front of me. And um, the problem is, is that it's not clear that the term cup picks out, say, a specific object, uh, because obviously the boundaries between different things are vague, right? I mean, if you zoom in far enough on that cup, um, then eventually you're going to find that it's difficult to draw an exact line around what the boundaries of the cup are. And so you might think that even with a claim like the cup is on the table, we are not expressing something that is like completely perfectly true. Um, maybe there's still some need for approximate truth there. Maybe a better example actually would just be something like um, uh, if I say, oh, I, I don't know, um, that I'm five foot six, right? Um, so, okay, that's that's true, but of course I'm not exactly five foot six mm -hmm. because you know we know that height changes throughout the day. You know, if I lie down, I'm going to be a little bit taller because of the, you know there won't be the gravity compressing my spine, <laughs> and uh, you know uh, obviously if you like zoom in far enough again. Uh, uh, does the hair count, right? Where exactly are we drawing the boundaries? So there's all of those problems with making it precise. Um, it looks like we want to say that that's true, but we're probably going to have to say that it's in some sense approximately true. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, a, a realist is going to say, well, yeah, our theories don't get it exactly right, but actually, you know, we never get it exactly right. I mean, none of our representations of anything, um, at least none of our representations of anything in the empirical world are complete and perfectly accurate. Um, I think, so yeah, I, th I think that's probably the way to put it, right? Um, and I think that's probably something that both realists and anti-realists would agree on, right? We never have access to complete and perfectly accurate representations of anything in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, there are problems with approximate truth, but uh, I feel like those are probably problems that we are that, that both sides of this debate are going to have to confront. Um, does that, that make makes sense? sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense, and that's good. Um, I know there's yeah, I I enjoyed watching your video and even the the work of the person you were relying heavily on. Um, it's interesting because I was talking with one of my philosopher friends, uh, Josh Rasmussen, about. Um, I forget what's what's his last the, the referential realism guy where he's talking about you know the, the vague boundaries and, and whatnot. Oh, is this um is this Paul Teller? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I actually um was a, I I'd gotten confused about what you were referring to there. So yeah, Teller. I should say Teller's position is a relatively new one. Um, mm -hmm. so you know, that was why it like um. Yeah, that, that's why I say that I don't see that as necessarily a uh, a point that a lot of anti-realists would use. Yeah. Um, but no. Um, sorry. It, yeah. No. No. I was just going to say, something. like, yeah. No. I um, after after your video on that, and I I've looked into his, some of his work, and I was just talking about how this might apply in different domains and like uh, philosophy of mind and other sorts of things. So I just wanted to um, make that connection and how yeah, you're right that it's probably going to be 
this notion of approximate truth and approximation and these points about you know referential realism and whatnot these are probably going to be like you said um applying across uh the the different boundaries between the, the realists and the anti-realists so this the well, actually i mean that's um that is teller's own position right mm -hmm. so um you, you know teller has kind of cr criticized the the realist notion of truth mm -hmm. um but he's also criticizing the anti-realist notion of truth because anti-realists traditionally um, want to say, okay, well, we, we have access to the observable world and we can make claims about observable things. And so there are truths about observables that we can express, like for instance, the cup is on the table, you know, or I'm five foot six. Um, and, and tell us like, well, actually, right, no, even in the case of observables, um, you know, there are a host of problems when it comes to sort of understanding what it is for a statement to be true. Um, but then, you know, that's going to apply to both realists mm -hmm. and anti-realists. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, I guess um, one final thing to dwell on here uh, for talking about realism and defining it is there are different strands of realism that I want my audience to be aware of. And I guess two quote unquote major strands might be entity realism and structural realism. Of course, within structural realism, you got like ontological or ontic structural realism and epistemic structural realism. We don't need to go that far, but um, we might just want to touch on entity realism and structural realism, uh, because these guys are going to have different conceptions of and potentially different responses to, uh, well, not only the arguments against scientific realism, but in favor of scientific, scientific realism as well, because, you know, some some structural realists say might uh, respond to say the pessimistic meta induction, which we'll cover later on, they might say, well, hey, actually, although science is um, so the history of science is a history, it's a graveyard of failed theories, there's a significant amount of overlap uh, concerning the, the structural relations and the abstract mathematical structural relations uh, across such um, theories. And, and so the pessimistic meta induction would be blocked. My point that is, or my point in saying that is just that um, this distinction is pretty important for evaluating the arguments for and against realism later on. And so I think that uh, our audience should probably uh, be familiar with that. So can you just uh, maybe define this difference uh, for us here? Um, well, you know, I think actually you, you kind of expressed structural realism quite well um, mm -hmm. because yeah, so the, the structural realist is going to say that, um, well, I guess I should just sort of say, right, that the, the point of this is that, um, just in general, right, what a lot of realists have done is they've kind of moved towards uh, forms of selective skepticism. So um, realists, uh, in the face of various arguments from anti-realists, have said, well, okay, maybe we shouldn't say that our best theories are true just across the board. Um, but what we can do is like specify particular aspects of those theories as being true. Um, and a structural realist will say um, that we can believe the structural content. And I guess the best way to just intuitively think about structural content is to think of it as the mathematics, right? Like the mathematical laws and relations of the theory. That's not quite right. That doesn't, but that kind of gives you an intuitive sense of what they're, what they're getting at. Like you can um, look at, for instance, mathematical laws um, uh, uh, as that they're preserved across theories. Um, so, you know, something like, um, you know, N Newton's laws, for example, um, even though the underlying ontology of Newtonian mechanics is now known to be false, um, it's been displaced by general relativity, you can recover at least an approximation to Newton's laws in general relativity. Or if you just take something like, I don't know, Snell's law um, about the behavior of light, right? that law is preserved across a whole bunch of different theories of the nature of light. So originally light was thought of as being streams of particles, corpuscules. Then it was thought of as uh, being a wave in a luminiferous ether. Um, today we think of it as, well, you know, photons, which have, you know, bizarre quantum behavior, wave particle duality. But across all of these different theories, Snell's law is preserved. Um, so that's the, the structural really, right? They're gonna say, we believe in the structural content, the mathematical content. And uh, the entity realist says, um, very different view, the entity realist, because the entity realist will be actually very, very skeptical of the truth of laws and structural content and stuff like that. What the entity realist says is, well, we can believe in the 
things that are postulated by the theories, the entities. So we can believe in electrons and black holes and mitochondria. Um, well, I mean, exactly which entities they're willing to believe in will depend on what exact what arguments they use. But, um, you know, so electrons, for example, we can believe in them. And the reason why we can believe in electrons is because we manipulate electrons to build things like electron microscopes. You know, you can literally like shoot streams. Yeah, Ian of Hacking, right? Ian Hacking, yeah. if you can spray them, then they're real. <laughs> Right. It, that's a great quote. Yeah, I, I like that one. And that kind of sums it up. Um, so um, and there are different there are other kinds of selective skepticism as well. Um, but, you know, hopefully that gives a bit of a sense of the of the options that are, that are available to uh, a realist. So, you know, you don't just have to say, OK, well, our best theories are true. Um, you know, you might be a bit more selective about it. Um, so. All right. Sweet. OK, so that's realism. And now we can move on to a kind of anti-realism and perhaps we could just focus on, well, maybe perhaps your view here, but I guess what are some of the main alternatives to realism on offer? And the, you know, the broad label is of course anti-realist, but you know, you can get into more specific ones like constructive empiricism and whatnot. Um, so can you just uh, give us maybe a little bit, uh, just a quick lay of the land and in particular your view? Yeah, well, okay. So I, I when I was talking about realism, I, I um pointed out these sort of three dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. The metaphysical, semantic, and epistemological. Um, so, okay, one, one alternative to realism is to deny the semantic claim and to say that actually theory shouldn't be interpreted literally. Um, as I say, this isn't very popular these days, but it, it has been popular in the past. Um, so for people who hold this view, um, there's just not even a question of whether or not theories truly describe the observable, because the unobservable, because they're not even trying to do that. Um, more popular, forms of anti-realism these days. So um, I think by far the most popular form of anti-realism in philosophy of science uh, today is, uh, is, is going to deny the epistemological claim. Um, so the claim will be, yeah, there is an external world and you know there's a fact about like the way the world is, mind independently, and uh, they try to describe it, but it's just there are good reasons to be skeptical that theories actually successfully do that. Um, so uh, constructive empiricism um, is um, probably the most influential form of anti-realism. And that literally just says, well, the aim of science is to give us theories that are empirically adequate, where to say that a theory is empirically adequate is to say that it correctly describes the observable phenomena. So, you know, OK, it correctly accommodates the facts about cars and trees and mountains and oceans. but uh, electrons, uh, <laughs> mitochondria, black holes, right, we should be skeptical of all of that, of anything unobservable. Um, then uh, there's, so, so then an another way to challenge realism would be to deny the metaphysical claim. Um, and so this kind of view would be a kind of, uh, a, a sort of perhaps constructivist type view, where we might say that, um, you know, theories, our best theories are true, right? And they do correctly describe the world and we're justified in believing that, but um, the facts are in some sense constructed by us. Um, like we, you know, we make the facts. So it's, it's not the case that these theories are describing a mind independent world. Um, so um, I, I guess a, an, in, an intuitive way to think about this kind of view would be, um, let's take for instance color right color classification um when i say that grass is green right you might say okay that's true but there's a pretty good argument right that greenness is not independent of me that i'm not describing a fact about the mind independent world partly because um my impression of the grass is green is due to the interaction with my visual system obviously a different organism would see it completely differently and partly because the way in which we classify color um, is like a highly uh, uh, kind of dependent. On, well, it's 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 different in different societies, right? There are some societies that just don't have um, the classification of things as green. Um, so that is grass is green is true, but it's perhaps kind of constructed by us. It's it's or at least it involves our input. Um, we're not just mirroring the world. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I think those are the, uh, the kind of main the main ways of, of challenging realism. Um, 
So that's that. Yeah, no, that's good. And so now we've kind of, just for the audience, we, we've defined realism. We looked at some of the aspects of that, the metaphysical, semantic, and the epistemic claims. We looked at approximate truth and also the different kinds of realism, like entity and structural realism. And then we just looked at different forms of anti-realism. So now we're moving on to some of the motivations for, at least we're going to probably hopefully just look at uh, the motivations for realism and assessing some of those, or at least some of the primary ones. And then also going on to looking at um, some of the motivations, or at least the primary ones, for uh, constructive empiricism. So now we're just going to uh, turn, hopefully, to, um, well, probably the, mo the most influential argument for scientific realism. I think I'm just fine saying that, but the no miracles argument. So roughly, uh, the no miracles argument is just going to say, like, listen, science is enormously successful, right, in terms of its predictions, novel predictions that theories weren't, you know, constructed so as to fit, but like new, surprising, novel predictions. So predictive accuracy that kind of uh, success, technological success, right? So science has propelled us forward in the modern world just in an unparalleled manner. Uh, and also seemingly explanatory success, right? So science seems to uncover um, and remove mystery about why things occur, why the rain falls, why you know, all sorts of different things happen. So th this, there are whole hosts uh, of ways that science is successful. And so we have to ask, well, what best explains that, right? Why? Why is science so successful? Now, Putnam famously said, as you know, and probably a lot of your listeners know, uh, he said realism, scientific realism, is the only philosophy of science that doesn't make the success of science a miracle. Uh, it would just seem to be this kind of cosmic miracle, cosmic coincidence, if theories that are indeed false didn't... Um, it would seem a miracle if theories that are false were so successful, were so successful at removing mystery and explaining these things and facilitating technological developments and predict, you know, these novel predictions. Um, and so it would seem as though we should, we should accept that philosophy of science, which provides the best explanation for the success and scientific realism provides the best explanation for the success. And so we should accept uh, scientific realism. Uh, so I guess that's the broad outlines. And, and you know you can do a Bayesian form as well. You can say, oh well, um, the probability that we would we would see such success conditional upon the truth of our mature scientific theories is much greater than uh, the probability that we would see such success conditional on the falsehood of such theories. And therefore, we have evidence for Bayesian confirmation theory, blah blah blah, uh, for uh, scientific realism vis-a-vis -vis, uh, scientific anti-realism. So that's the general general structure of the no miracles argument. And so I guess I'll turn it over to you to, you know, what are some different ways? Well, firstly, if you want to comment on that exposition. And secondly, uh, what are some ways that anti-realists respond to the no miracles argument? Yeah, I mean, so just one point um, that might be kind of worth noting is that, um, you know, I think that the realist would probably add, okay, so, I mean, first of all, when we think about how you're going to justify any kind of philosophical theory, um, philosophers tend to use inference to the best explanation, right? I mean, so they're insofar as they're claiming that realism is the best explanation for the success of science, um, you know, that's sort of an application of um, a more general epistemological framework. And it's also something that you find applied in the sciences as well. So, you know, why do scientists adopt, say, general relativity? Well, because general relativity is the best explanation for a whole bunch of, you know, phenomena, right? And so a lot of realists will see themselves as just um, extending to philosophy of science um, a, a kind of a form of inference that is um, already like widely accepted, widely practiced. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, well, like you say, that's kind of that's that's the that's the central argument. That's the big one. Um, it's kind of hard to because there are, there are lots of different ways that anti-realists have pushed back against this. I think that. Um, the most, so I, to, to me, the most compelling response, or at least like intuitively compelling response, um, is is just to find uh, well that we can find plenty of examples of theories that were remarkably successful, but that turned out to be false. Um, and there are sort of two things that we can draw on to do this. One option is to look at the history of science. Um, so. Newtonian mechanics, for instance, was back in the 1800s. Um, I mean, the most inc incredibly powerful theory that anybody had ever developed, right? Like in terms of its predictive accuracy, in terms of its explanatory scope, um, it, it was 
inc it was a theory of incredible power. I mean, it still is today because we still use Newtonian mechanics today to send probes to Pluto. So, you know, um, this is a really, really successful theory. But, oh, look, it turns out that it's claims about the underlying uh, structure of space and time and its claims about how that relates to you know mass and so on and gravity it's just wrong um it's now being displaced so you know an anti-realist will say well okay you know it's it, it might be difficult to see how um you know you you can get such remarkable success right from a false theory but we know that that has happened um also when you look at contemporary science um there are falsehoods everywhere, right? Science is, is littered with um, idealizations. Um, an idealization is basically just a falsehood. It's, it's something that we know is not true. Um, so uh, for instance, um, if you are, I, I don't know, giving a model or in biology of like the uh, selective processes in the population, you might model the population as if it had an infinite number uh, of, of members, or if you're uh, modeling a star or something, you, can, you might model it as if it were composed of an ideal gas. Um, and we do all of these things because, uh, well, I mean, there's many, many reasons. Uh, one primary reason is just that we have to do that in order to simplify the equations. But like, clearly we can get remarkable success from models that we know contain falsehoods. Um, so this, I think, I think that that point is um, quite, uh, yeah, quite quite uh, persuasive to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also say that we can challenge, I think, the, the, the kind of value of the realist explanation insofar as, um, like, we might wonder, well, okay, what exactly is the connection supposed to be between truth and success? Because as we've pointed out, right, and as all parties to the debate agree, um, realists do not claim that their theories are perfectly true, right? They claim only approximate truth. Um, and the trouble with that is that it looks like there are examples where relatively minor changes in the on in the sort of underlying uh, ontology or structure structural claims of a theory lead to completely different predictions. So I'm thinking of things like um, you know you you see this in the so-called fine tuning arguments, yeah. and this is potentially controversial. But you know uh, there there are a lot of people who think well if you were to take um, I, I don't know, the, the strong nuclear force and then make it like 2% stronger, um, the universe just wouldn't exist, right? Like, it, or at least it would have uh, collapsed back in on itself a couple of seconds after the Big Bang. Okay, so, so let's take our contemporary theory, our contemporary like cosmological physical theory, right? And just adjust its claim about the strong nuclear force by 2%, right? Well, now we have a theory which in terms of its uh, kind of underlying ontology and underlying laws is really, really similar to our to the one we we accept, but it makes completely different predictions. So, you know, I, I think that it's it's easy to see what the connection would be between perfect truth and empirical success. Mm -hmm. It's a bit less obvious what the connection is between approximate truth and empirical success. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, I mean, well, you know, there's lots of other things that could be said here, but I, I, I think that's a, a I, hopefully that's a point, um, you know, that we can perhaps mm -hmm. build from. Uh, yeah, no, th there's, there's the challenge. Um, I think I think the point about, well, I get, I guess, well, there might be three different ways that you could go about um, responding to it. You could try to find success. You pinpointed successful but false theories. You could also try to find true but unsuccessful ones, and that's kind of what you're getting at at the end. It's like or at least approximately true, right? Because you yeah. can slightly tinker with, uh, by the realist's own lights, approximately true theories. You can slightly tinker them to make them approximately true. And yet they are drastically unsuccessful. They make you know, pathetically wrong predictions. And so, yeah, successful but false theories, true but unsuccessful theories uh, might potentially pose challenges to this. Now, something that you brought up that I found really interesting was um, idealization and simplification in science. and. I think an interesting point that um, that can be made here is that it seems that these falsehoods are oftentimes actually essential to the success of some of the predictions. It's like it's precisely because we idealize that we can make a lot of these really, really good, really accurate predictions. Um, by contrast, if we were 
not to idealize, then things would get extremely unwieldy, extremely difficult, and we probably wouldn't even have the kinds of successful technological development and predictions and whatnot. So it's almost like it's precisely because we have the falsehoods, the idealizations and the simplifications that at least on many occasions, you get the kind of success that we see. So I'm wondering what you think about that kind of way to bolster what you're saying. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I, absolutely. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know, I think, I think you've put that, um, put that very well. Um, you know, there are uh, kind of ways out for the realist, I mean, in, in response to any of these things. So, you know, I, 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 I don't wanna sort of make it seem like, you know, this is somehow a kind of knockdown argument because, yeah. um, you know, th there are no knockdown arguments in philosophy. Um, but, you know, th yeah, no, this is, is a, I, I think, very, very serious problem, right? Like, so, um, because what the realist is ultimately doing, to put it in you know, very simple terms, is trying to make an inference from success to truth. Um, and we can, we can point to all of these cases in which um, idealization, as you say, are essential in allowing us to actually make the predictions that we that we do um like it's it's not it's not even possible well certainly not possible in practice for us to remove all of the idealizations even in relatively simple cases like if you take say um models of uh, a pendulum um the, the the kind of simple pendulum is something that is a uh, it, it, it assumes um so let's say you've got a bob on the end of a spring right well, it's going to assume that the bob is a point mass. It's going to assume that there's no friction, no air resistance. It's going to assume that the gravitational field is perfectly uniform. Um, it's going to assume a whole bunch of other things, which I can't think of off the top of my head. But there's a long list of uh, idealizing assumptions, and we can get rid of some of them, right? Like so, um, and this is kind of what a realist will look at. They'll say, well, hey, you know, we can get rid of some of these idealizing assumptions and make increasingly accurate predictions, but the problem is we we never get rid of of all of them um and the interesting thing is that if we did get rid of all of them like let's imagine that we had a model of a pendulum that removed all of the idealizing assumptions so it was perfectly but perfectly true right i have a pendulum here and i have a model of that pendulum that is perfectly accurate well now notice that my model of this pendulum because it's perfectly accurate to that pendulum it's not going to apply to any other pendulum no. so I have, in a sense, uh, reduced, I, like I've increased the accuracy, but I've massively reduced the explanatory scope, mm -hmm. because now I have a model, I have a perfect model of this particular pendulum. Um, but what we really want is a model that applies to many, many pendulums. And so this is why, so this is why idealizations kind of play an essential role um, in the success of our theories, because part of the success of our theories is um, well, as I, as I think you mentioned earlier, um, you pointed out the uh, explanatory success, right? The explanatory scope, the fact that we can kind of unify a whole bunch of different things under a single scheme, right? That's a really uh, important function that theories play for us. And it seems like some idealizing and simplification is actually essential for them to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh... You know, as much as I'd love to dwell on the no miracles argument further, um, and you know, maybe I'll put some links in the description for people to um, look into it further, because of course there are going to be realist responses to that, and you know, anti-realist further responses and whatnot. And there's a lot of really interesting literature on this, and like I said, certain Bayesian arguments uh, from it. But yeah, um, I suppose um, just just before we do, I should say just so everybody's clear, like, I'm very firmly on the anti-realist side. Yeah, so yeah. I'm hearing um, a biased view of this debate, <laughs> if you were to talk to somebody else, uh, they would probably have quite different things to say. Yeah. Um, no, um, so just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I guess uh, for the audience as well, um, I am a, a scientific realist, so, but I, it's not my area of like pri primary research. As my audience knows, I mainly do stuff in philosophy of religion, philosophy of time, metaphysics. So uh, I have very tentative views uh, in this matter. And, um, but yeah, I, I'm just trying to, you know, facilitate an unbiased presentation here as, as much as I can with you. So, <laughs> so, so let's, um, let's move on to, we covered the no miracles argument. Maybe let's move on to one more argument for realism. And uh, it's the fact that we seem to have a bunch of different ways of corroborating 
um, let's say certain postulates of a theory, whether it be the entities or, um, or other aspects of the theory, like you might have um, a proton NMR machine that can give you a certain result. And then you might have um, a microscope that gives you like exactly what you would expect if the thing existed. And you might have uh, some other kind of independent means of uh, corroborating that the thing exists, even though it's unobservable and it's something that uh, anti-realists would like hiss at. Um, so uh, what do you, can, can you, I guess, perhaps speak further to this argument from corroboration? Because I, I, I didn't give a, as robust of a presentation as I did with the no miracles argument. So maybe speak further to what the realist is really getting at in this argument from corroboration, independent corroboration in particular, and also how uh, anti-realists go about responding to it. Well, um, so this kind of argument comes up in lots of different contexts. And I don't know if there is a single argument, yeah. as it were, right? So um, it's, it's interesting. This actually follows on quite nicely from what I was saying about idealization, because um, one sort of line, right, that realists will take here is to say, well, okay, yeah, right. Like we, we have um, a bunch of models and they um, include all sorts of idealizations, but look, um, very often scientists will generate multiple models of the same system right so you know when we're again like if we're, if we're modeling a pendulum we can come up with all sorts of different models of that pendulum with different idealizations again you know modeling a star right you will sometimes model it as if it contained an ideal gas you'll sometimes model it as if um you know it has a constant density throughout the whole star sometimes you won't you know you'll use different idealizations in different contexts and so um one way in which um, this kind of argument is applied is to say we can identify um, assumptions that hold in all of those models that follow from all of those models. So if you've got, um, I don't know, let's say you've got like five different stellar models, okay, and they all contain different idealizations, but all of those models tell us that the internal structure of the star um, is a particular way, like, you know, there's like a core and then a radiative zone and then a convective zone, just to give a simple example, right? Um, and so all of these models, despite all their different idealizations, point at the same result. Um, so then the thought is that that result is robust over various models. And so you've kind of, uh, in a sense, discharged the idealizations specific to any one model. So that gives you, you know, a way out of the idealization problem. Um, another context in which you find this argument uh, would be uh, if we're uh, so like anti-realists um, will uh, very often argue that, you know, we're not justified in um, believing claims about things beyond what we observe. And the realist will say, well, you know, if you look at something, if you take like a particular sample and you look at it through a microscope, right, you can find, you know, structures in a cell um, and you can find those same structures, whether you look at them through an optical microscope or whether you look at them through an electron microscope. And again, these instruments, right, uh, involve completely different processes. Um, and I mean, that's not like even a theoretical claim. You know, you can just see, you can observe that those instruments work in very, very different ways. And yet they all give us the same picture of what's going on, you know, beyond the observable. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, again, I, I, in, in a certain way, right, we, we end up just coming back to this point that um, wouldn't it be a kind of a miracle, right? Wouldn't it be a, so if, if it were not the case, so if mitochondria did not exist, it would just be a miracle, right? If these, if these completely different physical instruments, right, showed us the same structure in cells, that would be a weird cosmic coincidence, wouldn't it? Um, that's, uh, I, I think, the idea, right? So it's, I mean, th there is, I mean, potentially there is an argument here that this isn't really a dip. This is not actually a separate argument. This is just another application of the no miracles argument. Um, some people have suggested that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, again, I think you can see the, the intuition, right? That if you have multiple means of accessing something and all of those multiple means give you the same answer, that seems to lend support, you know, to the, the, the representation that it's presenting. I think that. <laughs> I think. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, one way that um, I know some people push or some anti-realists push back on this is to challenge the challenge the claim that these are independent from one another. So, you know, whenever you're developing some kind of technology um, or some kind of instrument, 
you always have to corroborate it in some way. You know, you always have to like, you, you have to be sure like, hey, this thing needs to be accurate. It's getting the right result. It's truth tracking. And how do you do that? Well, if we're talking about unobservables, you have to compare it to some of your other instruments. And you have to say, oh yeah, that thing is telling us that. This thing matches this. And we know that this one is reliable. So, and that's how you conclude to the other ones being reliable or truth tracking or, or what have you. And in that case, they aren't actually independent from one another. And so, um, although it might seem as though that, you know, they might work by different mechanisms or they might, um, you know, have various differences, if they are ultimately dependent upon one another um, in, in this way, and this might be a more general phenomenon about instruments uh, at large, if they're dependent on one another in this way, it seems as though we lose a lot of that, um, I guess, the, uh, the argumentative force, the dialectical force of the, the cosmic coincidence, because they're all, a lot of them are dependent on one another. So yeah. that's, I know that's one way that they uh, respond. Maybe you can comment on that and perhaps your, your favorite way of responding. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that's, um... I don't know if I find that that particular response or that persuasive. And I mean, the, the, the reason is that so, I mean, okay, a lot of it would depend on, on how exactly we're defining the idea of two instruments being independent of one another. But I think that my intuition is, um, it's like, okay, you know, if you could show me an instrument, right, that when I look at a cell through this instrument, it reveals something completely different to what is revealed by the optical microscope or what is revealed by an electron microscope right and it's what it's revealing is um like there, there are patterns that it's revealing that are like stable and that you know we can make predictions about and you know we can then uh, uh like interfere with the patterns um in such a way as to bring about other results and so on like if we could do all of that right so if we if we had an instrument that was giving us a completely different representation of a cell um you know that was still kind of stable and reliable um then i feel like you know we'd we'd have a, a, a chat well that would obviously be a challenge to the realist picture um but that never happens right like that's just that's never so it's it's not as though we had a bunch of instruments like that but then we were like, oh, well, we need um, some way to, you know, we need to corroborate them. So we're just going to go with these two instruments that happen to show the same thing or that, you know, happen to reveal the same kind of patterns. Um, we've just never come across an instrument that has produced reliable representations that completely contradict those of others. So I, I, I do find that response, I mean, it, you know, even, even as an anti-realist, I find that uh, I, I, I sort of clutching at straws. I, th I think that, that my, um, no, my, so, my favorite take on this is, is well, I guess sort of two prongs. Um, the first prong is to say that really this is just another inference from success to truth. And I'm already doubting that inference, right? Like this is, as I suggested, um, I see this as really just being another application of the kind of no miracles argument, which I have independent reasons to doubt. Um, the other thing I would say is that I don't actually think it really matters that much um, if we, uh, allow the instruments reveal the unobservable phenomena. So um, there is much, so like e even if you think that when you look through an electron microscope, um, you're seeing structures that are really there, right? You're, you're so, so far away from um, uh, like, you know, the kind of claims that are made by our more general biological theories um, or, you know, just yeah, th theories in general, right? Like, um, so, I mean, as I see it, entity realism, some sort of entity realism, which is what you get from this argument, um, is a very minor concession. Um, you know, because I mean, I'm, I'm happy to believe that there are some entities, right? Like, I'm happy to believe there are cups and trees. And like, if I have to push it a bit further and say, well, yeah, there are bacteria and cells, I, yeah, that's, that's not really a big deal. Um, I mean, remember that anything that you see through um, uh, any kind of instrument, like an, an electron microscope, has undergone a great deal of like uh, preparation, and um, you know, like th th things have to be fixed and stained and manipulated in particular ways. And then you're going to be making uh, extrapolations from that to how things are in the environment. And in fact, we know um, from like if we're talking about uh, I don't know, bacteria, for instance, um, we can only cultivate about 1%, or we think, uh, of the bacterial diversity there is, right? So 
what you actually see through these instruments is a very, very, very narrow part of the world. Um, so, so yeah, I, uh, I think, I think that's the sort of response I, I would take. Um, all right. Yeah, no, that, that's good. Okay. So, you know, unfortunately we're going to have to leave the arguments for realism, uh, and, you know, start, there are others, of course. So, um, the realists in the audience are, you know, shedding a single tear, but that's okay. We can move on. Um, and you know, maybe, uh, you know, just check out uh, KNV's other videos on scientific realism if you want to hear some of those other ones. But um, also check the links in the description because I, you know, I've decided that I'm going to put some sources in there. Okay, so now let's move on to arguments against scientific realism. And uh, I know in the outline that I set, sent you, you know, I, I listed a lot of them, but maybe let's just um, look at, uh, let's see, uh, maybe the pessimistic meta induction because I'm really interested in that one. Um, uh, unconceived alternatives. And then finally, I guess we'll just go on to what moved you towards your kind of an current anti-realist view, and then we'll close it out. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the pessimistic meta induction. Yeah. Uh, basically, the history of science is a graveyard of failed theories. So the argument goes, you know, you have like miasma theory of disease, where it's like, bad air somehow or something like that that causes it and you know you've got like caloric and you know all these other sorts of postulates and theories and all these other sorts of things that are just flat out wrong even by the realist lights and uh if that's the case if the history of science is this kind of fail graveyard of failures um why it, it would seem to be arbitrary to just privilege oh our current theories are fine but no all those past ones uh no they they're they're the failures so really what this this is just saying is like oh well our history of science is a you know history of failures uh and our current theories are at least relevantly similar to those we uh, don't have some kind of really special reason to privilege ours above them and so we can inductively infer that uh our current theories are probably likewise uh not true they are similarly um they similarly belong, or at least will eventually belong in that graveyard. So uh, that's kind of the general thrust of the argument. And uh, I guess I'll turn it over to you to either comment on that or maybe give give maybe your take on it. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think that's a very good summary. Um, yeah, um, or, uh, countless success, successful theories in the past are wrong. So in, inductively, we can infer that our current theories will probably be going to be wrong as well. Um, it's I, I think the pessimistic induction is a really great argument for making anti-realism intuitively plausible but it's it's a bad argument as an argument i, I don't like I it don't either yeah it induction, right <laughs> yeah so i don't like it it's the kind of thing where um it's like i say if, if you're explaining anti-realism to somebody then that's exactly what you do you know you appeal to these past theories that were successful and false but actually i i just don't think it works and i mean so part of this obviously is you know i i'm i'm kind of a Humean and I am skeptical of induction. Well, I don't necessarily want to say skeptical, but you know, my take on induction is such that I, um, I, I, I don't think that, how should I put this? Uh, I don't think any inductive inference like that is, is, is rationally compelling. Um, I, I don't think there's anything irrational about, um, uh, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to go into this actually. Uh, I, I'll set that aside, but I would point out that I expect that most people who are attracted to anti-realism would probably similarly be more inclined to a sort of Humean line on induction, right? I think there's probably a lot of overlap there. So, you know, in fact, I know that's the case with Baz van Frassen, um, who is, you know, the, the most prominent anti-realist. He doesn't buy induction. So, uh, you know, um, pessimistic induction doesn't work for him. But um, no, the, the main problem is, right, even, even if we accept traditional, a traditional view of induction, um, I don't think the inductive inference works because contemporary science is, is radically different from, yeah. from past science. Um, and I mean, there are so many differences that you, you can point out here, but I think that for me, the most compelling one would be something like this. Um, when you look at these past theories, so um, particularly stuff like phlogiston theory and caloric theory, in their time, right, they, they were very successful. And, you know, they did have reasonably wide explanatory scope and, you know, they could be applied. Um, yeah, yeah they, they made successful predictions and so on. The thing is that with contemporary theories, um, at least with our central theories, uh, they seem to be so um, kind of deeply integrated with like with each other that the only way that like if you were to show that one of them was wrong right you're just going to have to do away with like the whole framework so 
if it was so if you were to show for instance that um there are no electrons right i mean think about what would have to change right you know you, you, our our view of um you know uh, uh um I don't know electricity and electrical circuits, right? Is like the Krebs cycle, you know, Krebs, you know like it, it right? everything is going uh, out, like the Krebs uh, cycle, uh, yeah. like yeah. <laughs> our, our view of you know the production of the aurora borealis, yeah. Our view of uh, thermonuclear fusion in the core of the sun, um, you know, our view of all sorts of biological phenomena, right? We appeal to physical theories in such a huge range of cases, and I don't think that was ever really the case with things like phlogiston and caloric, or at least, you know, you could. I mean, you could kind of, so I suppose in a sense, right, there's a sense in which, say, caloric was applicable in a wide range of conditions because caloric was an account of heat. And obviously there's lots of circumstances in which we um, interact with heat, but they never made like specific quantitative predictions in such a wide range of cases. And they weren't so deeply integrated with theories in general. It's, I, I don't think that there's any particularly good reason to expect that our central theoretical claims will be displaced in the future. I mean, I should say, I wouldn't be surprised if they are, um, but I just don't think that the, that the history of science provides a good inductive reason to expect that they are, because there, there do seem to me to be um, some significant differences between yeah. contemporary science and past science. Um, so that, yeah, I, I, in, 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 for many reasons, um, I'm not persuaded by the pessimistic induction. Yeah. I mean, I also take that kind of relevant, that's my favorite response, pinpointing relevant differences between them that kind of blocks the inductive inference. And like you said, there are lots of others, uh, including how many uh, scientists and the interdisciplinary aspects that you were pointing to. Um, and I, I think one author, um, one philosopher did this thing where he like proportioned um, you may have talked about this in one of your videos. So I watched those like years ago, you know, your scientific right. videos. But like, I, I remember one philosopher was like proportioning, he like drew it on a line and he was, he was proportioning. I know who this is. Yeah, yeah. I, he, I, he was this. Ludwig Farback, I think. Yeah. I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, but I think that's who you're referring to. Yeah, exactly. And he's like, um, he's pointing out that like the scientific papers that are produced and the number of scientists working is like doubling every 15 or 20 years or something like that. And, and if you like proportion the amount of scientific work going on um, and you like put it on a line, actually what you see with this quote unquote history and graveyard theories is that in the infancy of science, you have, yeah, lots of failures, but then there's this huge portion of the line where there, it's not like that. And that's precisely what um, you know, you'd expect. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's. I mean, I suppose the the way to think about it is about like ninety five percent of all scientific work that's ever been done has been done since nineteen twenty. Right, it's yeah. been done in the last hundred years. Right, and this graveyard of failed theories is generally found before nineteen twenty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, like, actually, most science it's 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 been pretty stable. Um, it seems so. Yeah. I did want to run by one one further response before we really quickly touch on unconceived alternatives. Um, I'm wondering if the pessimistic induction argument is self-defeating. I'm wondering. I, I I just want to turn it over to you and ask because um, well he, here here's why one might think that. So they're trying to say you know we can look at scientific theories. They're you know they're it's like a history of failures, and so we can infer the the failure of current theories or the probable falsehood of current theories. But like run this with philosophical arguments, like philosophical positions, or even arguments in the scientific realism debate. I don't know. It's like most philosophical theories in the past are utterly false and bizarre <laughs> and wrong. And um, so per this me meta induction, we should conclude that most current arguments and theories and whatever are wrong, including this pessimistic meta induction. So by its own lights, we should think that the argument doesn't really succeed. I'm wondering what you think about this kind of self-defeat response. Um, yeah, so this is this is an interesting point. I think that the, the best kind of line to take on this would be to try to argue that the pessimistic induction isn't really a philosophical argument. Um, so what you could then, what you might then try to say is, well, Oh no no it would still be it would still be self defeating um, actually uh, so I'm just talking off the top of my head right now but it's just occurred to me no that's so what I was going to say was um, it's it's an empirical argument right like we're we're just appealing <laughs> to the history of empirical theories and hey it's turned out they're mostly wrong 
Um, no, no, we can avoid, we can avoid it, we can avoid it. We can avoid the, the self-defeat in this way. So number one, you argue that the pessimistic induction isn't really a philosophical argument, it's just a straightforward empirical argument, right? So it's what, we'd, what we've found here is an empirical regularity about the nature of science. Um, so this is a kind of thing that it's not really philosophy. Um, this is really, I, I guess, part of the sociology of science or the science of science, right? Because it's, it's just inductive, right? You know, we're making observations and we're talking about the way science as an, a, an observable, like, social institution works, right? Um, and then what we say is, okay, look, the changes that have occurred throughout the history of science are changes in the underlying ontologies. Um, they're changes in the claims about the structure and nature of the unobservable world. The pessimistic induction is not making a claim about underlying ontology or anything like that. It's not offering an explanation. It's literally just saying, right, there are, there are, these, there's, there are these changes in the way that science as an, like, like this, is, this is a observable regularity about the nature of science. So an observable regularity about the nature of science is that over time, the uh, underlying ontologies of its theories tend to change, okay? And so I think, that would avoid the self-defeat, right? Because the pessimistic induction appeals to observable properties and it makes a prediction about what will happen like to things that we observe in the future, right? And it's not a philosophical argument, it's a purely scientific argument. And science, although we might be anti-realist about the unobservables, right? Science does latch on to observable regularities. Okay. That's my attempt at a response. <laughs> I'll have to think about that further. Um, <laughs> I'll definitely have to think about that further, you know. Um, but for now, I think we can probably move on very briefly to unconceived alternatives. So um, this one I probably want to spend the least amount of time on. Um, but, you know, the idea is, uh, hey, like, let's look at that pessimistic meta induction. Maybe we don't think it works. But like, why? Why were those past theories oftentimes failures? Well, oftentimes they just didn't really the, the scientists developing them didn't really conceive of you know alternatives whether it be conceptual things when it you know when it came to you know einstein and whatnot like we needed some conceptual development before that happened so like unconceived concepts and unconceived methods and unconceived data and other sorts of things like that's precisely why a lot of these past theories say um didn't work it's because the scientists that developed them there were lots of un alternative theories that were, you know, would be better than them, but they just didn't really conceive of them. And so if that's the case for all these past theories, well, why isn't that the case for present theories? Surely there are lots of unconceived alternative theories that are even better than and would supplant, say, our current theories. Uh, and so it's similar to the pessimistic meta-induction, but it's like focusing on the reason why maybe a lot of those past theories failed and, you know, attributing it to unconceived alternatives um now my one of my worries for this is again a kind of self-defeat but i'll turn it over to you um what do you think about that exposition and you know maybe your response yeah i think the way that um so that was proposed by a guy called kyle stanford and i think the way stanford puts it is that um this is more like an induction on the capacities of scientists right um so uh yeah it's it's just the claim that yeah we, we look at the history of, of past science um people just failed to conceive of the alternatives that were available to the, the theories at the time. Um, I tend to think that this is a bit more, this has a bit more going for it than the pessimistic induction does. And the reason is that, um, so I, I mentioned that there are these radical differences between contemporary science and past science. Um, and in particular, right, we, we can endorse the unconceived alternatives argument even if we take no opinion about whether current theories will be displaced, because it may be the case that one of the features of science is that it becomes increasingly systematic. And so increasingly, like you get connections between different fields and, you know, you sort of build up and you know, all sorts of different theories and models connecting with each other. I mean, that's what we find in science, right? Like you, a biologist who proposes a biological model, it has to be um, at least consistent with contemporary physics and will probably sometimes even appeal to um, like specific models in physics. So um, what I guess the point is, is that over time, as this systematicity increases, right, there's going to come a point where um, even if there's a completely different way of conceiving of the world, it's just no longer accessible. Um, 
because in order to like get there we'd have to throw out like everything and that would you know it's like with with caloric well you know back then we could throw out caloric because it really wasn't connected to all that much um so you know it was just we were changing our theory of the nature of heat these days you know well can't throw out electrons because they're just connected to too much so i think that the unconceived alternatives is is it, it perhaps has a bit more of a better prospects in that sense but um I don't know, again, this isn't the sort of line that, that I'm inclined to take, again, because it is, you know, these these sort of inductive arguments I tend to be sceptical of just in general. So, um, and as as you mentioned, there are, there are, with the unconceived alternatives, there is a serious problem of um, it applying to itself, like unconceived, unconceived objections yeah, and un unconceived like, objections. exactly like the history of philosophy is such that every philosopher is like got this great new theory is like, the, the succeeding philosophers conceive of objections that the people who proffered the theories, who proffered the arguments, couldn't or didn't conceive of. And so surely this is going to be applying to his own argument. That's my biggest worry. And yeah. Um, but anyway, I guess I guess we could probably just for the last maybe um, 10 minutes or so, we can uh, just look at why, I, I don't know, why, what, what is your major or major motivations for uh, being a constructive empiricist or being an anti-realist. Um, so I guess I'll just turn it over to you maybe just to sketch why. Um, okay, well, I, I suppose I should say, first of all, I mean, my, so I, I would count myself as, I think, I, uh, yeah, a kind of constructive empiricist. Um, but so I'm agnostic about the nature of the unobservable world. Um, and with respect to observables, I'm a kind of constructivist. Uh, so I'm not really a, a realist in any sense anymore. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like the slogan would be constructivism about observables and agnosticism about anything unobservable, right? So, uh, but um, all right, what was it that, that made me change? Well, I don't know, it's, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint something specific. And I mean, part of this is because, well, I, I mentioned earlier, as far as I'm concerned, there are never any knockdown arguments in philosophy. Um, I think that um, I I know that when I was an undergrad doing my dissertation, I did my dissertation on the No Miracles argument, and I went into it intending to defend it, and I found myself unable to do that because as I was writing about it, I just found myself, uh, you know, ac accumulating like th there were too many problems. And the thing is, once you've once you've given up on the No Miracles argument, um, I think that what underlies the no miracles argument is this inference from success to truth. And um, I became very skeptical of that, of that inference from success to truth. And I, part of the sort of reorientation that happened with my philosophical approach is that I wanted to account for success in general um, in ways other than appealing to truth. Because the thing is, is that once you've started to become skeptical of realism, it does at least for some philosophers, I think, it, it raises a serious challenge to a lot of other things that you're doing elsewhere in philosophy. Um, if you're doing philosophy of time, then, I mean, am, am I right in assuming that that's probably going to require a kind of realist view of science? I, <laughs> yes. I think, right? Like, yeah, if you, definitely. If you become an anti-realist, that would be a problem, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I had this like same kind of thing, because a lot of the topics that I was interested in, that I was thinking about, actually rested on a realist view of science, right? Um, so once I became a bit skeptical that that was gonna work, I, I had to radically rethink things. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, these days I would say that I'm a pretty hardcore empiricist. Um, and I think that I pursue empiricism as part of a general project of um, attempting to account for the success of various practices, not just science, but, you know, I mean, science obviously has its own type of success, but there's lots of practices we engage in, like, you know, I mean, uh, well, you know, um, moral talk, for instance. Again, I'm a moral anti-realist, so I want to account for, or mathematics, right? Part of empiricism, as I see it, is accounting for the success of these practices without, um, you know, postulating entities um, beyond what can impinge on experience. Um, and that kind of gave me a, a, a new way of approaching philosophy and uh, a, a new kind of program to follow. And that's what I'm following. That's what I'm following now. Um, so 
as for the reason so for the more specific reasons i mean i think i've kind of already mm -hmm. like talked about them earlier right like ultimately i don't find the no miracles argument persuasive i think that idealization poses a really serious challenge to realism um i i'm not persuaded by the pessimistic induction i'm not persuaded by uh things like under determination arguments which we didn't really get into but yeah. um no there's 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 enough to push me to the anti-realist side so um I feel like that maybe wasn't a very good a very good answer. Uh, no. it's kind of rambling and touched on all sorts of things. You know, it's difficult. It's uh, like but... asking, no, it's like asking you know someone who spent their well, I don't know. It's it's like asking a, a you know a philosopher of religion who is either a theist or an atheist. Like, why are you a theist? Or like, why are you an atheist? It's like there are so many different considerations. You know, it's like you know, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, ultimately, what what we're doing is you know we're weighing up lots of different yeah. things, right? And lots of different arguments. All I can say is that. Um, so once you reject the success to truth inference, and once you start thinking of, I mean, I no longer buy inference to the best explanation in general, right? I don't think that inference to the best explanation is a guide to the truth. Um, again, if you if you become skeptical of that, it's very hard to defend any kind of substantive realism. Um, uh, I think that in, in almost all forms of realism seem to rely on some sort of inference from success to truth. So once that's out, right, anti-realism becomes much more um, appealing and yeah i i just think that the, the ultimately the considerations weigh in favor of anti-realism but i would say um i uh i don't think there's anything uh, you know as i see it, i don't think there's anything like uh irrational about being a realist um if somebody sort of just says well i'm just going to take our best theories um as like you know guides to reality and i'm just going to believe them um i don't think that that would be uh a rationally indefensible move. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm pretty um, conciliatory in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think that's that's a good way to to end uh, our discussion. We we've been uh, somewhat biased throughout our, our presentation, you know. But I think uh, ending on a conciliatory note is is going to be good. Uh, I guess. Uh, yeah. Thank you for coming on. And if you want to say any any final words about either the discussion or um, yeah, I'll just turn it over to you for some final words. I um, don't think I have any final words. I mean, thanks for having me on. That was, um, yeah, <laughs> that that was fun. And uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, do bear in mind, you know, that that you you were getting a, a very biased view <laughs> there because. Um, oh, it's like your video on. Uh... <laughs> Oh my goodness, your video on Nukem's problem was hilarious. I love that. It's like you're like I'm a committed one boxer, and I think the other the, these guys are crazy. But yeah. I'm going to try to present the arguments. I love that. I'm, video. I'm not. Um, I should say I'm not conciliatory about this. So realism, <laughs> right, is is perfectly rational. Yeah. I think two boxing is irrational. Um, yeah. but I'm prepared to go that far. Um, I think that they are. Yeah. So I, I'm not conciliatory about that. I am a one boxer, and I think that if you're a two boxer, you are indeed behaving irrationally. So, um, uh, are you great. a two boxer? Uh, I lean towards one boxing, so I do. I lean towards one boxing. I'm, 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 I, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm as firm as you, but I definitely lean towards one boxing. So um, what's his name? Um, oh, he was on Alex Malpass's channel, Thoughtology. Uh, he is in the UK. Um, I think he's at Cambridge. Anyway, his name is evading me right now, but he's written a lot in defense of one boxing and he's got really good work on it. But um, anyway, I'll just, uh, man, I can't believe his name is escaping me, but um, we're just going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to deal with that. So uh, anyway, thank you for coming on. I guess uh, we can end it there. Everyone, again, check the links in the description to, to go after sources and uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy internet encyclopedia philosophy and different papers that i'll put in there as well as kb's channel go to his channel subscribe and uh yeah so uh, i guess what better way to end it there than i'm joe schmidt this is the majesty of reason and peace out hey.